Good morning and welcome. Here we are again for the life of me. I never would have guessed that someday I would become a televangelist. But here I am on the YouTube once again, and you are enduring with me. Praise God. Had a lot of fun last week for our drive up service, and we're going to be doing that again next week for Father's Day. So we'll look forward to seeing you in the parking lot and. Uh, but today we are continuing on in Acts. We got some good stuff from the beginning, the first half of chapter 17. But before we jump into chapter 17, I want to recap some of the things that we looked at from a couple weeks ago in the 16th chapter. The knowledge and power we need for every challenge we face comes through relationship. Relationship with the Lord. Uh, he gives us the gift of each other. Think of uh, the text from John 15, the vine and the branches. The Lord just works through us to bless others. And uh, the power that we need and the knowledge we need to handle every situation that we come up against, it's not through the right kind of words or our merits that we have earned or rituals that we performed. It's through a living relationship with the Lord. And uh, it is the Spirit who directs Paul and company away from one area to go to Macedonia. So uh, another thing that we looked at from last week, you remember they're in jail. And what are they doing? They're singing and they're praying. And uh, we know how the Lord worked in that situation. So the second thing is when you're stuck, I said pray and sing hymns to God and watch what the Lord does to move situations around you. And I think it seems like such a simple thing, but even in those simple things, if we're faithful in them, I think the Lord uses them to bless us. And then number three, uh, everywhere the gospel goes, it breaks down walls that separate people. Uh, it heals us of our blindness to each other. Praise God for that. You know, there are a lot of walls separating people these days. There's a lot of blindness to one another these days. This Philippian jailer, he's just doing his job. He had no idea when Paul and Silas would be arrested and when he would tie them up that eventually these would be the men who would literally save his life and give him hope and help him discover what real life was. So those were some of the, the lessons that we can garner from the 16th chapter of Acts. And uh, today we're looking at a few other things. Uh, in the 17th chapter, after we find Paul and his humiliation in Philippi, he moves on to new territory. And they make their way even further into Macedonia, this time going from a district uh, uh, capital, administrative capital, to the real capital of Macedonia, Thessalonica. It says, when we had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. There, were, there was a Jewish synagogue there, and as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. So Thessalonica, it is a seaport. There's a lot of commerce that passed through this city, and at this time already, it was the second largest city in ancient Greece, just behind Athens itself. So this is the location that, that they're in. You can see in this picture, there's a little bit of the ancient wall that is still there in uh, Thessaloniki, I think it's called today. So Paul follows his normal pattern. And uh, over three Sabbath days, possibly consecutive Sabbath days, we're not really sure, but over a fairly short amount of time, he is using the Old Testament to teach people about Jesus, about who the Christ is. So we're not told what scriptures that he uses uh, specifically, but we can infer, I think in my mind, it's probably a fairly short list of what, what he might be using. 
So in Acts chapter 13, 35, we've already seen Paul use Psalm 16, verse 10, to make this same point about Jesus. Uh, you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see decay. So this, this Holy One of God will not decompose like a normal body. And then I think of Isaiah 53. I think there's some, some verses in Isaiah that lend itself to uh, this kind of argument that Paul is making with other Jews very easily. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. But after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. I just, I love that verse. It just makes me so happy for Jesus. I think it's great. So Paul is using this and he's proclaiming these things. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. And some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. So in reasoning from the scriptures, they're able to convince some people and, and some of these that are included are these prominent women. They're mentioned again, and they will be mentioned uh, more times coming up. Gentile women, in particular, they seem to be a demographic with hearts that are hungry for God. As an aside, while I was doing evangelism in Tanzania, East Africa, uh, when we would break into new areas, the success of the church really seemed to ride on what the, what the faith of these women would be in this new community, and eight out of ten times, it would be the women who responded to faith in Jesus first, later on um, uh, bringing in, drawing in children and husbands. Uh, these, these women would. So that they mention, that they're mentioned as prominent women suggests that they had some kind of connections, some influence, some resources. Yet even as they f uh, find success with certain groups of people, in the sharing of the gospel, there are some people, there are others there who resist. Once again, we find jealous Jews. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. You see, everywhere the gospel goes, it produces fruit. Praise God for that. And yet everywhere the gospel goes, it seems like time and time again, they are constantly facing resistance. Uh, we've already read about jealous Jews in Acts. Jealousy that they're, not in the one, that they're not the ones in control of access to God. Um, jealousy over the Gentiles being included. Jealousy that some of their members of their club and their synagogue are being siphoned away and joining this other thing going on. So when people act out of jealousy, they tend to unleash a lot of chaos in situations. Even, you know, maybe they don't intend the full extent of that, but when I act out of, a person acts out of jealousy, they just seem to unleash chaos. And uh, these Jews are crafty, and they know where to find people that they can influence, and they know where to find these troublemakers that they can stir up and who are willing to form a mob. And um, there's a certain group of people that they, they want to be a part of a mob just because of the life of the mob and the energy it brings and just, it just the chaos that feeds itself. So they rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd, but they did not find them. So they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials shouting, these men have caused trouble all over the world and have come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. So this is all taking place, uh, probably uh, the marketplace for sure, and in the ancient Agora, 
This is the uh, ancient agora of not the modern buildings in the back, but uh, the stuff all in front. This is this uh, area where they would be draw, uh, where they would meet in front of officials of a city, and they would be drawn into that area. So this is the place where Paul is and where Paul is standing, uh, which is kind of interesting. And I include these things sometimes to. Uh, to show, you know, we think of Bible land and Bible stories as, you know, f far away in space and time, but these are real events, historical events, historically verified by extra biblical sources even, and these events um, happen in real places, and we just need to remember that. So that's why I include some of those slides from time to time. Uh, so somewhere in this Agora area, when they can't find Paul and Silas, they bring Jason and other brothers, and they raise these charges. The most serious is a kingly rival of Caesar himself. Now these charges, maybe they're trumped up a little bit. They're not entirely truthful, because there's really no effort by these disciples or Christians to um, be seditious or to overthrow uh, Caesar himself. And yet there's a truth to them because the demand of Jesus is to be Lord of our hearts and our lives. And that means he demands allegiance to himself above all other allegiances. So when they hear this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. They then made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. So these are serious charges that they compel Jason to post bond, which likely means he's paying some kind of legal security, some kind of guarantee that this missionary group is not breaking Roman laws. So because of this bond that they posted, and no doubt out of concern for the safety of Paul and Silas, they make plans to get Paul out of town, and they get him out of town after dark. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. So again, uh, this pattern is being followed. Berea was not probably on the coast. It was inland a little bit, a backwater town in Macedonia built on a number of terraces. It's f about 45 miles west-southwest of Thessalonica. And it says this interesting thing about the Bereans. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So what qualifies this statement of them having noble, noble character? Well, their noble character comes from their eagerness and their willingness to search these things out that Paul is saying, to see if they are true or not, rather than just dismissing Paul out of hand, rather than just accepting Paul out of hand. They get some skin in the game, and they actually go and do some fact-checking on these things. So it says, Many of the Jews believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Again, Greek women are mentioned but it seems that because they're willing to study for themselves, Paul and Silas have greater success among the Jews of Berea than they did at Thessalonica. Thessalon Thessalonica. A word of Paul's success gets out, and it isn't long before these jealous Jews, again, they hit the road to try to track Paul down. So it says this in verse 13, When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. So apparently a three-day journey from Thessalonica is not enough distance. And that's amazing to me because personally I've never upset a group of people so badly that they have ever tried to track me down with the intent of causing me harm. Can you imagine what that would be like? It's, it's different. 
but once again, uh, we find them employing the same strategy of creating social unrest in order to discredit Paul and his associates and garner influence to steer people away from embracing the gospel. They're using this to try to disrupt everything that Paul and Silas are trying to do. So the brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So first, don't miss that the church is taking care of its own here. When situations come up and these attacks start, when they, when they start trying to persecute Paul, uh, the local brethren, they step up to keep them safe. And uh, they move them to safer locations. So this time, Paul moves not just 45 miles, he moves even further away, almost 200 miles from Berea, all the way to Athens, Athens, the intellectual capital of the Greek world, where the work will continue. So let me just quickly retrace with you uh, Paul and company's movements in Macedonia for this week. So remember, they head over to uh, Philippi, and Philippi is where uh, they have that incidence with Lydia. They find her and uh, this slave girl who is set free from um, uh, the spirits that, she, that were controlling her to uh, fortune tell, and then the Philippian jailer. All that happens at Philippi. And then remember the crowd, the crowds are stirred up and they strip Paul and Silas and beat them. And uh, even though they didn't know that they were doing this to Roman citizens. So anyway, in Philippi, they're shamed and the brothers there uh, have them move on. And so they leave from Philippi and they head on down, eventually coming to Thessalonica. So the Jews in Thessalonica try to have Paul and Silas arrested after they gain some converts. They don't like the competition coming their way. So at nighttime then, they skip out of town and they head down south, uh, west, southwest to Berea. I think it's probably inland a little bit more and not right on the coast. But these Bereans, because they're willing to search out the scriptures for themselves, it says they're of more noble character. And then from Berea, uh, likely they travel by sea in order to get around Mount Olympus. You almost have to go by sea unless you go way inland. Uh, they come uh, through the Aegean Sea and into Athens. So that's kind of where uh, the story of, of what is happening in the second missionary journey has led all of these different places in Greece now. And we'll pick up uh, in two weeks, uh, when we're back online for the YouTube service, we'll pick up with Paul in Athens. But as we close today, I think there are several significant things that I want to draw your attention to. Lessons that we can learn from Acts chapter 17. First, we just have to say and own that, you know, the gospel, it's polarizing. It is polarizing. Uh, there are a lot of people who are resistant to accepting the yoke of Jesus' lordship. And so a question we have to ask ourselves as rich Christians in an age of, comf uh, a age of hunger, as comfortable Christians in an age where we can, you know, find all kinds of pleasures and delights and things like that, at what point do you ever step up and try to put your neck on the line for Jesus? That's not a comfortable question to ask, but I think it is important to think about that sometimes. The battle to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not an easy thing. Opposition is common. Maybe not this kind of opposition that Paul is facing, but opposition nonetheless, because you know we are in a war for people's hearts and their minds and their eternal destinies are at stake. And yet we seem to not live up to the fullness of that a lot of times. See, Paul, he seems to hardly be able to get a word out of his mouth before he's attacked. 
It's not comfortable to put your neck on the line for Jesus. It's a lot easier to just keep your mouth shut, to go with the flow, to, oh, they'll kind of see from my lifestyle, and, uh, and we let that be the only, th I think that's a good thing. Absolutely praise God for that. Uh, and we're, even the Thessalonians, Paul says that, that you win them over by your, your, your pattern of your life. And, and yet, somehow, words have to be a part of, uh, we have to be able to explain why we live the way we live. And uh, when we don't, that is a problem. Because in your silence, many times, other voices are going to speak. This this world screams at us. This is what you need to be afraid of. This is what you need to pay attention to. This is what is really valuable. This is what is true. This is, these are the people who have knowledge. They have knowledge, but these people over here, these Christians, they just have faith. Don't listen to, you know, there are all kinds of voices out there. And uh, sometimes we yield the floor of our own voice, of speaking up in Jesus' behalf. We give up ground there too quickly and too easily because it's hard to put your neck on the line for Jesus. So it's interesting, and we have these events recorded in Acts, but we also have other windows into what's taking place there. Uh, the, the letters Paul writes to the Thessalonians. So in chapter two, verse one and two, it says this, you know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi when they're stripped naked and beaten, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. We dared to tell you. So how do they do this? It's because they have the help of God. With the help of God, a faith and a love that is so strong that they're willing to take the risk of sharing even with great opposition. Second lesson for us. Oftentimes our efforts, they don't seem to be enough that we can reasonably expect any kind of positive result. But if we are faithful, even in small things, uh, probably especially in small things, if we are faithful and try, the Holy Spirit will take uh, those situations and those efforts and he multiplies the fruit of them. And that's an important thing for us to remember. It doesn't seem like a few weeks in Thessalonica would be enough to plant a church. Paul didn't even have the opportunity to be, he's, we've told he's got three Sabbath days that he gets to share. And then we don't know how much time outside of that. And yet uh, the Holy Spirit takes this. As we read, you know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. It wasn't a failure, even though they're, they're driven out of town and they have to sneak out at night. It's not a failure because the Holy Spirit takes of their efforts and produces fruit that honors him, that honors God, uh, that grows the church in faith. So then a third lesson. I would say just, just take a page out of the book of the Bereans. They eagerly examine the scriptures. It says daily they examine the scriptures. They invest by searching out the truth. They get skin in the game by actually taking the time and making the effort to try to figure these things out. And so, uh, church, we need to have that kind of character as well. Examining the scriptures, studying the scriptures, it helps us recognize and understand what is true, what is meaningful, how do you become a good person, uh, Scriptures, they wash the filth out of our minds. Scriptures, they confront us with the holiness of God, a God who is completely unlike me and totally different. And uh, when I look at this God, I think, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I see the dirtiness of my own heart. The scripture confronts us with the, guilt, uh, with the filth and brokenness of our own lives. And so if we spend time there, the ways that God can use that, we need to take a page out of the playbook of these Bereans. All right, so those are some things from Acts chapter 17. And just a closing thought, I find Paul's zeal and his tenacity 
and uh, the drive that he has, even going into dangerous situations, knowing that this is going to cause turmoil and opposition and that he'll be rejected. You see, this is very far from my own experience. I've uh, not faced a whole lot of persecution in my own experience of faith in Jesus. But I look at Paul and I think, what drives him? And I never get a sense that Paul was vindictive or ever tried to retaliate against these people that persecute him. He's certainly never vengeful with them. And he doesn't even really seem to have fear as a motivation for avoiding certain things or going in certain areas or not. So I think in the end, the only way that you can explain this kind of behavior, uh, it's only great love that would express itself. Great love that was given and received over the course of many years that would build a Saul into a Paul to have this kind of character that they are able to constantly put their neck on the line for Jesus Christ and have what God desires and what God wants as their first thought and not as an afterthought. You see, at the center of this universe, the very core of all reality, it's not chaos. It is a heart of love. And the closer Paul gets to this divine love, the greater his capacity to face whatever challenges come his way. The closer that Paul gets to this heart of love, the more perfectly he can go into situations and bring the love of Jesus Christ despite all the voices that want him silenced, all the opposition, all the people he doesn't, uh, that don't want to hear what he has to say. In spite of all of that, Paul goes to those places because of the love of God. And because he has the love of God, he knows that despite opposition, there are some whose hearts are ready to respond to faith in Jesus Christ. And so love drives him to find love with others. And uh, I think uh, the reason Paul is baffling to me is that in many ways I'm still scratching the surface of the fullness of what God desires for me to be his man. And uh, we're as a church, we're scratching the surface of what God desires us to be in this place to express his love. And so I think it's only by going deep in this love that we're going to uh, fulfill what God desires for us. It's only by going deep into this love are we gonna be able to stand against what our current day and age is throwing at us and against us. Uh, From pandemics to social unrest to whatever area of our lives where faith in Jesus Christ has been uh, told to exit the room and get out of here. Love will keep us on the right track. So that's our lesson for today. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, Enjoyed getting out and greeting some of you over these last couple weeks. So uh, take a look at this video of uh, some of your brothers and sisters in Christ as we look forward to a time we get to meet together again face to face. Let's pray. God, uh, I thank you for this day. I thank you for uh, the faith and boldness that Paul um, shows. I thank you that you take our meager efforts and you multiply the fruit of them. I thank you for, for brothers and sisters who have noble character, who are willing to search for you and your truth and search the truth of your scriptures, Lord. Uh, Let us learn these lessons. Let us go deep in love for you to help us to become who you would have us be. Through Jesus, I pray. Amen. Go in peace. Your sky is 
is blue, your world is brutal. I've been trying to turn and face it. It's like there's curtains in the words, and I've been trying to let the days. I can believe until I see, but I just need to know you'll find me when the light bleeds in. I still feel it. I still feel it. I can feel it, but I'm on my knees again. Oh. Oh. 